so I have not always been a beekeeper. My background is actually in computer science. So I went to University of Washington, studied computer science, and then I moved back down to the Bay Area uh, to work at DreamWorks Animation. I got bees in 2011 and got connected with the Beekeepers Guild of San Mateo County and I started working with them doing children's presentations and now I run my own children's nature education company where I take farm critters into classrooms. The mission of the library is to cultivate community by welcoming all people to experience the shared joys of literacy and learning. The library really thrives on being inclusive and may having uh, resources and services available for everyone in our community. So in Redwood City, the prior beekeeping laws had setback requirements of, I think they were in the order of a hundred feet. So, so few uh, houses could actually keep bees legally. And so we worked to reduce the setback requirements and so that more people could keep bees in their backyard if they wanted to. And so I was at the meeting saying how we do our uh, new beekeeper education through the guild and how the bees that are in the area, how it won't be a public nuisance. So there was a lot of Q&A happening at the city council. Um, could you explain to me what a flight path screening is. Well, flight path would be the path that the bees take as they immediately exit the hive. So we can alter that general flight path where they stay low by placing screens, fences, bushes in front of the hive and directing them upward. And then they typically stay high until they find a flower to forage upon and then they drop back down. Chris so Beth, who is the Redwood City Parks and Rec Director, and I were at that meeting, and as they were talking about the importance of bees for our community and for our food supply and all of the things that, you know, the important reasons that uh, bees are important to our community, uh, Chris and I just started talking about, you know, what could the city do to help promote bees? And so we came up with this idea of the rooftop beehive, and we thought the downtown library would be a perfect place for it. So this drawer contains some beekeeping tools. We have the smoker that the beekeeper uses to keep the bees calm while they're working. It dulls their sense of smell so that they don't uh, smell the pheromones that other bees release when they get stressed. We had to uh, make sure that um, we were setting up the beehives in a way that they weren't going to be, you know, exposing customers who came to the library to bees, so we weren't going to put them right near the front entrance or anything like that. They had to be elevated, so working with the city attorney's office to figure out um, whether there were any uh, special insurance requirements or anything we needed to do to protect ourselves. Uh, so the worker bees are all female, the queen bee is female, and then the drone bees are male. So drones are actually only around to mate right. with queens and they mate with brand new queens. So there's actually only ever about 200 or so males in a hive mm -hmm. when there can be up to 60. The initial 000. reaction was kind of like, you know, surprise and delight. It's like, wow, that's something I didn't expect from a library, but it's really cool. We created a, a Facebook page for the bees that tell the story of what's happening in the beehives in their own voice, which is fun and a lot of people have enjoyed. Our Friends of the Library group, which is a nonprofit that exists to raise money to support library programs and activities, um, they sell the honey. And we agreed right away because we sell product and we had a bookstore that was a really great venue to be able to sell the honey to the community. Since we've started selling honey, we've made $11,000 in honey sales just from our little hives up on the roof. In January, we added a board member and um, I had been wanting a, a teenager on the board and she, at our very first board meeting, suggested that we do a bee cookbook and we request honey recipes from people and that we put together like a PDF cookbook for the community uh, to further spread the idea about the bees and to do it as a tie-in. And it was just, it's such a great idea and it's such a fun idea. Jenny Barnes, who's one of our library managers, 
and Kendall and I actually presented at the California Library Association conference in Pasadena one year that we did a talk about the library bees and there were about 50 people there from other libraries throughout California who wanted to hear about what we were doing and consider doing it for themselves. Because of the bees, we were able to bring in Meredith May. And Meredith May wrote a book called The Honey Bus. Uh, she lives in San Francisco, and we were going to be doing it in person. It ended up being a virtual program. So when we uh, talk about programming, we always encourage Derek to find things that are bee-related and that we can specifically target our bee funds toward things to help people understand bees better. So here we go. So here is, this is honey. And then these are actually the cocoons of baby bees. Oh. So you can see the cappings actually look different. Right. So these ones are almost like kind of a paler, almost translucent, like there is honey underneath them. Right, Whereas right. these ones are more opaque. So those are baby bees. So a lot of these bees here are nurse bees. So even though it looks like they're doing nothing, like walking over the bees, yeah. they maintain the temperature of the brood nest to mm -hmm. make sure it's always 95 degrees so the babies aren't getting too hot or too cold. Right, right. With climate changing and becoming more extreme and certainly warmer, um, what I found is there are more hot, really hot days. And bees like to actually be around the same body temperature as humans. So the inside of their hive is in the ballpark of 95 degrees. So if the air temperature is hotter than that, the bees are expending a lot of energy then cooling that hive through evaporative cooling and fanning their wings. The season is also becoming a lot longer. So bees typically have a dormant period in the winter, but as it becomes hotter and hotter, they get less of this dormant period which honestly can help keep them healthy from the diseases that the varroa mites carry because they need a period without babies. So our queen bees are not really getting a rest in the middle of winter and they're kind of going all year long, which can make them a little more ill. Some of the things you can do at home to help honeybees and the native bees in California is if you have access to some garden space is plant a blooming garden that supplies both nectar and pollen throughout the year. So having these overlapping bloom cycles and a variety of foods for the bees really helps them out. Um, if you can't do that, bees actually also forage for water. Um, so they do need water to cool themselves, they drink the water. Um, so creating a bee waterer, um, so it can be even just a dish with rocks in it so that the bees don't drown. Um, or you can support your local beekeeping organizations by either like buying honey from the beekeepers or donating to the beekeeping organizations because organizations like the Beekeepers Guild of San Mateo County do a lot of educational outreach. And so we're trying to get the word out to everybody about what they can do to help bees. We've engaged people in a new and different way. Um, we've had the opportunity to teach people about bees and the impact that they make in our world and the fact that bees are, you know, they're, they're our neighbors and they, they, help, uh, they help us. And um, so the opportunity to give back and help them um, is kind of a reward in itself. <laughs>